So here's one for you. How many songs do you know that were cut from a groundbreaking album and turned into a B-side a couple of times, then placed on a movie soundtrack as an afterthought, and then it rocketed up the charts to become a number one single? I mean, it doesn't happen very often, right? Well, that's the path that today's featured song took to get our attention. Actually, the band had it all ready to go as part of a double album. But their label demanded they cut the record in half because they didn't think the band was big enough, how wrong they were. Since they'd already written another song like it, they just dropped it. But as it turns out, this song resonated with a lot of people who felt like outcasts. I guess everybody loves an underdog. So get ready for an incredible story of a number one hit that never should have happened. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember camping out to get tickets to a concert or, you know, pushing a redial on your cordless phone over and over to try to get uh, the best tickets, you're going to dig this channel of musical nostalgia. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the bell so you always know what's coming out. Uh, we also have a Patreon where you'll get additional content there, and that can support our mission of more interviews and more videos, more history. And we have our merch below to keep the music alive. So today we're bringing you a B-side and a soundtrack cut from one of the most successful alt-rock acts of all time. The band, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The song, their 1993 single, Soul to Squeeze. You've got me by my soul to the song was a pretty big hit back in the day and has put up some really amazing streaming numbers on YouTube and Spotify since. But in terms of pop culture, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. Past 93, it doesn't have any noteworthy media placements and no significant covers on record. Which is really unfortunate because this song deserves so much more exposure. So let's see if we can remedy that today. The song was actually a B-side. It almost didn't get released at all. So to set the stage, let's jump back to 1991. Two years removed from their fourth studio album, Mother's Milk, featuring the hit cover of Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground, also on the Pretty Woman soundtrack. At this point, the band's ever-evolving lineup was starting to settle in after uh, the tragic death of guitarist Hillel Slovak and the departure of drummer Jack Irons. Uh, the roll call included Anthony Kiedis on vocals, Flea on bass, John Frusciante on guitar, and Chad Smith on drums. And together, they were on the precipice of a massive breakthrough. Uh, actually, their biggest album yet, Blood, Sugar, Sex, Magic. Now, the record, of course, produced by the famed Rick Rubin, who had previously produced Old School Rap Standards by Run DMC and the Beastie Boys in 1986. He also did uh, rock acts like when we just covered The Cult. Ruben took Kiedis and company to a mansion in Laurel Canyon where he set up an ad hoc studio. Uh, Rick wanted to get the band out of their sterile recording studio environment and give them something different than they'd ever experienced before. You know, a place that would uh, spark their creativity, so to speak. So Anthony Kiedis would say about it, Rick suggested that we consider recording in an unorthodox setting. He turned up this amazing, huge, empty, historically landmark Mediterranean haunted mansion a stone's throw from where we all lived. As we walked around the house, we uh, spontaneously decided to live there for the duration of the recording. You know, so we all chose our bedrooms in different wings of this house. End of quote. Notice that Keita said the house was haunted. It's kind of a big deal. Built in 1917, the mansion was reportedly frequented by a woman who had been murdered there in the 1930s. So during their residence there, each of the band members would actually attest to multiple supernatural experiences. Uh, in fact, Chad Smith was so freaked out about it, he actually commuted home after they were done recording every single night. He wanted nothing to do with this mansion. Uh, other legends have also sprung up about the house as well. Uh, allegedly, it belonged to 20 screen idol Rudolph Valentino. Also, Harry Houdini reportedly lived next door. Uh, Jimi Hendrix, he may have been a one-time occupant, if you were to believe some of the stories. And Kiedis was fully convinced that this was the house where two of the Beatles had first tried acid. <laughs> 
Now, whether the rumors uh, are true or not, the mansion proved to be the ideal environment for the band. Uh, their creative mojo was flowing big time. Now, Anthony said that they knew that they were doing the best work they'd ever done at this point. Uh, the Blood Sugar Sessions were a giant step forward for everybody in the band. They could all feel uh, this energy. Recognizing that they were making history for themselves, they decided to document the recording process, hiring videographer Gavin Bowden to oversee the project. Now, Bowden was given a $60,000 budget by Warner Brothers, who thought that the footage would be you know, a great marketing tool for the album. It was all ultimately packaged as an hour-long documentary called Funky Mucks. Definitely worth a watch. I think, uh, I think it's actually on YouTube. If it is, I'll link to it. In particular, your love for funk music would be someone that could be in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Released on September 24th, 1991, Blood Sugar Sex Magic was a career-making album, packed with the most diverse set of songs the band had ever recorded. It had the best of both worlds, really. On the one hand, songs like Under the Bridge uh, were melodically seductive enough to win over pop fans. Then there were tracks like Give It Away that still appeased the band's alternative fan base. In all, five singles hit the airways. Uh, Give It Away was released first, and then Under the Bridge, Suck My Kiss, Breaking the Girl, and finally, if you have to ask. Now together, these singles would slay the US alternative charts. All but one went to the top 20. Give It Away actually reached the top spot. And then of course there was Under the Bridge, which went to uh, number six on the alternative charts. Went all the way to number two in the Hot 100, making it their highest charting mainstream hit of all time. Now, if you're interested, we actually did do a deep dive under the bridge in a previous episode. Uh, you can look that up or I'll try to link to it below. Like I did that then, but take me to the place I love. Point is, the success of these singles made Blood Sugar one of the greatest alternative rock records of this generation. And it effectively broke the Red Hot Chili Peppers to the masses. However, for today's episode, it's not about what made it onto the album, but instead what was left off of the album. For the first time in the band's history, they had recorded more album-worthy material than they could fit onto a single album, single record. Now, this didn't surprise Rick Rubin. In fact, he had actually envisioned Blood Sugar as a double album, double CD. It would have been much more digestible in that format, is what he would argue. He said, I thought that the volume of material would have been okay as long as you stop and take a breath and then you change CDs. Well, the love for me. Now, as we find out what happened next, I do want to recognize our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the brand of glasses that I always wear. Right now, Zenny has the best deals on prescription glasses out there. The prices are amazing, especially in the current economy that we're facing. You can get a complete pair of prescription glasses for over 80% off regular retail prices. I mean, you can get three to four pair for what you'd normally pay for just one. Make sure that you click on the info button right up here or go to our link below to get the very best deals and to customize your own pair of frames. With all the dying trees, I scream. So Warner Brothers didn't like the double album idea. They didn't see it the same way that uh, Rick Rubin saw it. They were adamant that Blood Sugar Sex Magic had to be a solitary disc. I mean, they believed that the Red Hot Chili Peppers didn't have a strong enough fan base to justify a double set and how wrong they would be. At the end of the Blood Sugar Sessions, though, more than a few songs were relegated to B-side and collector's only status. Now, interviews from this era suggest that the band had recorded uh, either 25 or 27 songs during their time in the Laurel Canyon mansion. 17 of these made it onto the official release, which clocked in just under the max 74 minutes. That still left eight or 10 songs on the cutting room floor. Now this host of outtakes, Outcasts, included a cover of the Stooges' Search and Destroy, some Jimi Hendrix covers like Castles Made of Sound and Sick of Mick and Nico. Uh, that turned up on the Wayne's World soundtrack in 92. See. 
And then of course there is today's featured track, Soul to Squeeze. Now initially, uh, Soul to Squeeze went to work as a B-side on multiple Blood Sugar singles. Uh, took back end honors on Under the Bridge and Give It Away. However, it later came to prominence on the Coneheads movie soundtrack. Uh, the Dan Aykroyd comedic offering that centered on an alien family with uh, Coneheads. I seek that techno industrial complex where I might obtain two or three some nuts of platinum paste. You know, classic SNL skits, but didn't really resonate on the big screen. I mean, public consensus is that the most memorable thing about this movie is uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers song, Soul to Squeeze. Now, reportedly, the song got a spot on the soundtrack thanks to Dan Aykroyd, who personally requested the Chili Peppers contribute a track. Astronauts to the moon. Astronauts to the moon. <laughs> Bonehead. So the band was scrambling for something, anything. So they polished up Soul to Squeeze and they turned it in. Both song and film released in the summer of 1993. The for an entertaining look into the making of Soul to Squeeze, make sure to check it uh, in the Funky Monks documentary. It's really cool. Here you can catch uh, Anthony Kiedis recording his vocals and then Chad Smith using crash cymbals to create that distinct sound you hear on the song's bridge. Now, actually, to get the desired effect, they sped up the recording. They had you know, Chad do his thing and then slowed it back down to give the crash a, a deeper tone. We're gonna speed the tape up so they sound bigger. Now the song itself, not unlike Under the Bridge, has ties to Anthony Kiedis' all-consuming struggles with substance abuse. Uh, for instance, Kiedis opening the song saying, I got a bad disease, out from my brain is where I bleed. I got a bad disease. Insanity, it seems, has got me by my soul to squeeze. Anthony's battle with addiction has been well documented, I mean, including by himself in his memoir, uh, Scar Tissue. So I'm not gonna break it down too much more here. We've talked about it in the past. But understanding what he was going through when he wrote it definitely adds a, a deeper dimension to this song, a vulnerability that you just can't put words. Well, from my brain is where I bleed. Another interpretation that's resonated with a lot of people is that the song is about coping with uh, mental illness. If you go back to those same lines that I just quoted, I mean, I'm sure you can see how it fits or it resonates with you. But really, interpretations are subjective to the listener. That's how it should be. You know, so really you draw your own conclusions. One reading that has really stuck out to me is that the song is about Anthony's search for peace, for some kind of relief from the pain that he's experiencing. But not only for himself, but for the sake of others who are hurting as well. I mean, consider the lines, when I find my peace of mind, I'm gonna give you some of my good time. My of I think that message, it really hit home for a lot of us who were growing up during this time. A lot of us Gen Xers felt like outcasts. I know I did. Uh, like there wasn't a place for us. And songs like Soul to Squeeze, they really just gave you hope that Maybe we weren't alone. Just maybe there was even some of that peace of mind out there that Anthony Kiedis was singing about. I, I don't know, it really hit me. It hit home with me for sure. Red Hot Chili Peppers really played up this idea big time when they put together Soul to Squeeze's uh, music video. Set to the backdrop of a traveling circus, this black and white video featured a colorful cast of characters. <laughs> Outcast turned performers, including a conehead who was shot out of a cannon. I guess they had to tie in the movie, you know, somehow. Yeah. Kiedis also joins the fray as a Gorgon, you know, a Medusa-like character with snakes for hair. Also making an appearance in the video is Saturday Night Live comedy icon, the great Chris Farley who also played the role of Ronnie the Mechanic in the Coneheads movie, if you've seen it. However, there was one notable absence from the music video, guitarist John Frusciante. Uh, he was overwhelmed by their skyrocketing popularity. At this point, he decided to quit the band. Now for the video, the Chili Peppers hired director Ken Kerslake, who had recently worked with Nirvana and Smashing Pumpkins. Ken 
Ben said that he and Anthony had been wrestling with what to do for the video. Uh, since they were dealing with a record label and a movie studio, the guys were really concerned about being seen as, you know, sellouts. But then Kiedis came up with an idea to shoot the video in the style of the Todd Browning film Freaks. And after that, a light bulb went off in Ken's head, and from there, they were off and running. The shoot took a total of uh, three days and produced between seven and eight hours of footage. Ken claimed he could have made a full-on feature of what he shot, but after finishing the first draft in just one night, he knew he had it. He told Flea and Anthony, I know you probably didn't expect to hear from me this quickly, but this, uh, just take a look at it. I feel like this could be the final video. You know, the two watched it and uh, they said they wouldn't change a thing either. They called it kind of perfect. I think a lot of us felt that way. Very cool video. So Soul the Squeeze is the Chili Peppers' third highest Hot 100 hit from the 90s, behind only Under the Bridge and Scar Tissue. It went to number 22. Even better, it reached number 15 on the Cashbox chart. It went to number seven on the Mainstream Rock chart. And it went all the way to number one on the Alternative chart. A pretty incredible stats for a B-side turned soundtrack hit. Internationally, Soul to Squeeze climbed to number 11 in Canada, and it actually went to number one on the Canada uh, record chart. In Sweden, it reached number 13. Australia and Iceland, it went to number nine, as well as number six in New Zealand. So you know what, taking all of this into consideration, I gotta say that I think Soul to Squeeze is an essential Red Hot Chili Pepper standard. Uh, and with the reception it got, it could have been a standout track on Blood Sugar Sex Magic. So the question is, why was it cut? I, I think the answer here is pretty simple. The Chili Peppers already had uh, multiple down-tempo tracks lined up for Blood Sugar. Under the Bridge, I Could Have Lied, even Breaking the Girl. At this time, the style of song, it was really out of their element. I mean, these sock-toting exhibitionists they weren't exactly known for taking it down a notch, really. In fact, when Rick Rubin discovered Anthony's lyrics for Under the Bridge in his writing notebook, the frontman didn't want to show them to the rest of the band. It just wasn't the kind of song uh, the Chili Peppers did. It, it took some serious convincing for Kiedis to turn this personal poem into a worldwide smash. So if the double album concept was off the table, why risk alienating your fan base with a bunch of ballads? That's about it. I mean, they only had so many songs to put on the record. However, everything changed after Under the Bridge killed it on mainstream radio. Red Hot Chili Peppers realized that they were onto something, something special. And that really paved the way uh, to the sequel, Slow Jam, Sold a Squeeze to succeed, as well as a long list of down-tempo numbers in years to come. I mean, just Look at what happened next. 1995's One Hot Minute featured the number one alternative track and my favorite Pepper song of all time, My Friends. Then fast forward to 1999's Californication, which featured almost exclusively their slower stuff as singles. I mean, Scar Tissue, Other Side, Californication, Road Trippin'. First three of these went to number one on the U.S. alternative chart. And on the Hot 100, Scar Tissue and Other Side, they went to number nine and number 14, respectively. As a result, Californication, the album, has sold more than 7 million copies and 16 million worldwide, made it their number one selling album ever, all on the back of their slower stylings. So going back to Blood Sugar Sex Magic, I can't help but wonder, you know, what would have happened if Soul to Squeeze had made the cut? What if it had been released as a single from the album? How would things have been different, you know? Would they have worked out as well? Californication showed that they could release multiple ballads and still make a commercial killing, make an impact, but... Was the, the world ready for that back in 91? I mean, would releasing Soul to Squeeze as a single blunted the impact of Under the Bridge? You know, I don't know. I guess we'll never know for sure. But this much we can know. 
If Under the Bridge set the precedent for the Red Hot Chili Peppers' slow song success, Soul to Squeeze gets the credit for doubling down on this idea. It turned what could have been a Chili Pepper anomaly into a pattern of sustained success. Well, I got everything I need. So after all this, what do you think? Does Soul to Squeeze deserve more love? Like I pointed out earlier, it has no real meaningful appearances in films or TV shows or covers by other bands you know, that I'm aware of. I mean, other than on the Conehead soundtrack, where have you seen it in pop culture? Why is that? You know, when this song is such an essential part of the Chili Pepper rise to, to global stardom? It's a curious question. This was definitely a song that stood out uh, to me and really to my friends in high school for its deeply personal lyrics. You know, with Anthony's vulnerability on full display, I mean, his voice was one of honesty and depth. Amongst the raging sea of dream lovers and the whoops of mainstream radio. Soul to Squeeze, it was a beautiful anchor for the outcasts. It calmed our fears and it helped us find our peace of mind. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Red Hot Chili Peppers and Soul to Squeeze. What are your memories of the song? Do you remember when it was on radio in the summer of 93? Like I said, amongst the sea of uh, Mariah Carey dream lovers spending like eight weeks at number one and and uh, whoop, there it is. I mean, this was a song that spoke to me and I'm sure it spoke to you. Let me know in the comments below. Let's have a great discussion. What do you think about their ballads uh, and about this period in the Red Hot Chili Peppers catalog? Let's have a great discussion. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Thanks so much.